The Lord is nigh unto all them that call upon him, to all that call upon him in truth. Words from today's gradual. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Our Lord and King is near. He is coming soon. This week is Christmas. Are we longing for his coming? Do you want something from him? Start asking for it now. He likes to give gifts of grace at Christmas. But let us not forget his coming at Holy Communion because every single communion is a Christmas. Every communion is a Christmas. Now, when His Majesty, our Lord Jesus Christ, draws near to us at the moment of Holy Communion, we should pray fervently for the graces needed to fulfill the duties of our state and life. Graces to become more like Him. Graces to be faithful Christians. These are the presents He likes to give. An easy way to do this is to use the most beautiful prayer penned by St. Ignatius, called the Anima Christi, a prayer capable of deep intimacy. You know the prayer. It starts like this. Soul of Christ, be my sanctification. Body of Christ, be my salvation. Blood of Christ, fill all my veins. And on it goes. Beautiful prayer. Now, while praying this prayer, we can pause at each of the little invocations when we're praying this after communion, and we should ask specifically for what we need. And what do we need in these times of confusion? Love of truth and the hatred of heresy. That's what we need. Love of truth and hatred of heresy. So let's begin. Soul of Christ, be my sanctification. The intellect, the will, and the memory of Christ are faculties of his most regal soul. Thus, we should pray to have our minds enlightened and informed by his intellect, so that we have, as St. Paul says, the mind of Christ, so that we will know what he wants us to know and ignore the rest. How many errors, falsehoods, and lies and heresies are floating around us at this time. They're all over. How many times a day are we subjected to strange and false ideas? Once upon a time, King David exclaimed in the Psalms, I will not set before my eyes any unjust thing. Now, once upon a time, well, we used to have an index of forbidden books. Can you imagine that? Why did they have that? To keep us from unjust and untruthful things. Church is a loving mother. She wants to protect us. My goodness, what kind of index would we need today with the utter explosion of the electronic media? It's barraging our eyes and our ears with unjust, untruthful, and impure things. Can't escape it, it seems. How many false ideas are already rumbling around in our memory banks from all the strange ideas we have absorbed and all the strange and impure things we have seen? Oh, Lord, we should pray then and form my intellect with your intellect to know what you want me to know, to know you perfectly and to banish the rest. O Lord, purify my memory with your memory. Fill it with your thoughts. Fill it with your word. Now, as for the will of Christ, heart of Christ, we should also pray to love what he loves and to hate what he hates. What does his majesty love? He loves the truth. And what does he hate? Once he exclaimed to St. Teresa of Jesus, Alas, O daughter, how few there are who truthfully love me. Do you know what it is to love me truthfully? It is to understand that everything that is displeasing to me is a lie. 
Everything that is displeasing to me is a lie. Our Lord loves truth and he hates lies. He hates error. Our king himself states, I am the truth. My word is truth. In the desert temptations, our Lord said to the devil, that man liveth by every word that proceedeth forth from the mouth of God. And what word is that? The word made flesh, Jesus Christ himself. All that is true, all that is good, all that is beautiful is included in this one word. And that word became flesh and dwelt among us. And this is why the angel said to Mary, Blessed Mary, no word will be impossible for God. No word is impossible for God. Because the word is God. What's ever contained in that word, that's possible. Pope St. Clement said, Nothing is impossible for God except to tell a lie. Blessed Virgin Mary responded very wisely to the angel, Be it done unto me according to thy word, according to the truth, according to the plan of God, according to what is right, good, and beautiful. Lies, errors, heresy detract from the word. They attack and demean the word of God. Blessed Francis Palau, 19th century Carmelite, calls these things, lies, errors, heresy, claws of Satan. They're the claws of Satan. They seek to tear, to rip, and shred what is true. Thus God hates them. Our Lord said of those who lie and adhere to lies, you are of your father the devil. He stood not in the truth because truth is not in him. He is a liar and the father thereof. John chapter 8. Now in the light of St. John of the Cross, Carmelite mystic, 16th century, St. John of the Cross, there was a case of an Augustinian nun who became a prodigy in the university town of Salamanca. And she was in her 20s and had all the most illustrious theologians of the university and seminary visiting and following her due to the wonderful explanations she was given to the Holy Scriptures. She was an oracle. One of these authorities asked St. John his opinion of her. After meeting with her for about an hour, St. John of the Cross was the first to determine that this woman was possessed. Possessed by the devil. One of the ways he tested her was to see if she would speak the truth. And so he gave her a simple translation of the scriptures. Would you please translate this for me? Et verbum caro factum est et habit habit in nobis. We hear it every time in the last gospel. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And she replied, the Son of God became man and lived with you. Not the Word made flesh and dwelt among us, but the Son of God came and lived with you. This was not a true translation, and it was spoken just as a demon would speak. In other words, God came to dwell among you men and not among us demons. Thus did the mystical doctor know he was dealing with the father of lies. But of further importance to us is how he exercised this demon. Not only did he use the ritual of exorcism, but he also spent no little time untangling the lies in her mind with sound instructions. He had a catechizer for a long time, something like six months to get the demon out of her. One point, the father of lies, the devil was heard to say of St. John of the Cross, I cannot conquer this little friar, neither is there any way by which I can enter into him to make him fall. How does the devil enter into us to make us fall? He feeds us lies. We watch it, we hear it, and it comes inside. 
Loving the truth and hating error helps us discern the spirits and keeps the devil away. No wonder King David said, I will not set before my eyes any unjust thing. St. Paul taught that those who did not love the truth will be subjected to the power of Satan and will believe lying. I think there's a lot of believing in lies today. You can look that up. That's 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 10. But let's be more precise. We've been talking about lies, errors, heresy, the claws of Satan. Let's be more precise. Heresy, what's that? Heresy is where the truths of the divine and Catholic faith actually proposed as revealed by God through His church are denied or cast into doubt. Heresy attacks the deposit of the faith, truths we know by divine revelation. Heresy is incredulity about what we know through faith is certain. How bad is this stuff? How bad is heresy? Let's turn to Father Frederick Faber. He comes to our aid, 19th century English Oratorian. He said, The crowning disloyalty to God is heresy. It is the sin of sins. The very loathsomest of things which God looks down upon in this malignant world. Yet how little do we understand of its excessive hatefulness. It is the polluting of God's truth, which is the worst of all impurities. Yet how light we make of it. We look at it. We look at it all the time. And we are calm. We touch it. And we do not shudder. We mix with it and have no fear. We see it touch holy things and we have no sense of sacrilege. We breathe its odor and show no signs of detestation or disgust. Some of us affect its friendship and some even extenuate its guilt. We do not love God enough to be angry for His glory. We do not love men enough to be charitably truthful for their souls. Where there is no hatred of heresy, there is no holiness. A man who might be an apostle becomes a wound, an open wound, a festering wound in the church for the want of his righteous indignation. Thank you, Father Faber. Sobering words. Blessed Francis Palau, he speaks of heresy as being at the peak of the evil mountain that needs to be made low for the coming of Christ. It's the worst of the evils. Now, since Christmas is so near, let us consider a few heresies that are ever present in this time, touching on the mysteries of this season. First, the church has taught time and time again, as far back as the First Lateran Council at 649, and even earlier, that Our Lady was perpetually a virgin, retaining her bodily integrity before, during, and after birth. Listen to the First Lateran Council, 649. If anyone does not properly and truly confess in accord with the Holy Fathers that the Holy Mother of God and ever-Virgin and Immaculate Mary in the earliest ages conceived of the Holy Ghost without seed, namely God the Word Himself, specifically and truly, who was born of God the Father before all ages, and that she incorruptibly bore him, her virginity remaining indestructible even after birth. Those who refuse to accept this, let them be anathema. Heresy. Pope Pelagius, somewhat earlier, he died in year 561. This is what he said. Christ Jesus, true God, and the same true man proceeded, that is, was born while his mother's virginity remained intact. For the virgin remained such in bearing him, just as she had in conceiving him, Pope Pelagius. 
so special, unique, miraculous conception, so also special, unique, miraculous birth. Many of the Holy Fathers of the Church say His Majesty passed through the wall of her womb as He later would pass through the closed door of the tomb in the upper room, the closed doors of the upper room, leaving her virginity completely intact. Yet as many here know, this beautiful truth, this sublime reality is shamefully attacked during these last few decades especially, even by many inside the church. Movies are made of our Lord's life with the most blessed and ever virgin mother of God and labor pains on Christmas night. In other words, she lost her virginity. How many Catholic stores sell these movies and look past this most hateful of heresy? Ignatius Press has them on sale. Where is our hatred of heresy? Now consider a few more. Pope St. Pius X, he promulgated a syllabus listing of errors, that is, associated with modernism. This can be found in the document called Lamentabili Sane. Let us briefly consider a couple of them. Now keep in mind that these are condemned. In other words, God hates them. And so should we. Number 19 reads, Heterodox exegetes, scripture scholars, have expressed the true sense of of the scriptures more faithfully than Catholic exegetes. Condemned. In other words, what they're saying is, that, oh, I can go outside the church and look at these Protestant commentaries and I can learn a lot. Listen to Pope Leo XIII. The sense of the Holy Scripture can nowhere be found in corrupt outside the church. Nowhere and cannot be expected to be found in writers who, being without the true faith, only gnaw at the bark of the sacred scripture and never attain its pith. Pope Leo. Yet how many times have we heard, even from famous so-called orthodox preachers and prelates, that reading Protestant commentaries, most notably Barclay, Barclay, read Barclay, which, by the way, is filled with errors. Where's our hatred for evil? This same rather famous prelate was also repeatedly recommending the New English Bible, which has countless errors of translation, including Isaiah's chapter 7, verse 14, where it says, A virgin shall bear a son. It translates it as a young woman. Well, Boy, that's a sign. Millions upon millions upon millions of young women have borne children from the beginning of the world. There's no sign in that. Also, they call divinely revealed scriptures apocryphal in that Bible. Those Bibles are only good to be burned, period. The only safe Bible in English to read is the Douay Reims. So where's our hatred of what God hates? His Majesty said to St. Teresa of Jesus, all the harm that comes to the world comes from it not knowing the truths of Scripture in clarity and truth. You're not going to find it outside the church. It's getting harder to find it inside. That was number 19. What about number 35? Christ did not always possess the consciousness of His messianic dignity. Condemned. How many times in the past 50 years have we heard this heresy repeated over and over from our pulpits, in movies and in books and magazines? Some say Jesus didn't know who he was until the finding in the temple. Some say he didn't know who he was until he was baptized by John in the Jordan. Some say he didn't know who he was, shamefully, until he was dying on the cross. What absurdity! 
And I've heard it many times from the pulpit growing up. St. Paul says, Jesus Christ yesterday, today, and the same forever. Let us not be led away by various and strange doctrines. The fathers say he was, from the beginning, absolute in grace and in wisdom. In other words, from the moment of his conception, Jesus Christ, our King, knew who he was. He was fully informed, fully alive, even though his body was still developing. His soul was complete. He always knew who he was. Now, not surprisingly, if these heretics say his majesty was deficient in self-awareness, so also they say his mystical body, the church, is also deficient in self-awareness. Listen to this, another condemned proposition. Uh, The organic constitution of the church is not immutable. It can change. Like human society, Christian society is subject to a perpetual evolution Condemned. How about number 59? Christ inaugurated a religious movement adapted or to be adapted to different times and places. Condemned. Hateful to God. Over the last few decades, we've heard over and over about how the church has to learn new things about herself. How she's on a path of self-discovery. We've also heard over the, re- over the recent months that the church's innate hierarchical structure needs to be altered and adapted to our times. Ding, 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 ding. Danger. There's talk about the excessive centralization of the church and the need for the conversion of the papacy, as well as giving even doctrinal authority to national conferences of bishops, which is a recipe for division if there ever was one. What's going to happen when the U.S. comes out with this doctrinal statement and South America with one that's different? Are we the same church now? On the other hand, we know that Christ, the head, and his body, the Holy Roman Catholic Church, are one and the same thing. As members of the church, we may come to understand her better and better as time goes on. But nevertheless, if the head, Jesus Christ, is perfect, it's the same yesterday, today, and forever, so to his body. She does not evolve. Thus, Pope Pius XII, echoing the previous teachings of the popes and councils, he said, the church is a perfect society, a real supernatural kingdom that is above the whole natural order. It's heavenly, cannot change. Furthermore, another condemned statement, one from this time, blessed Pope Pius IX, 19th century, comes to mind here. Namely, it is erroneous and condemned to say, quote, the Roman pontiff can and should reconcile and adapt himself to progress, liberalism, and the modern civilization, end quote. Condemned, hateful to God. In a word, if souls are to be saved, and the world and all its inhabitants are to find Christ. They are to adapt to Christ, not He to them. The church is here for you. It doesn't adapt itself to modern secular world. We conform to her. She does not conform to us in our fallen state. This is the error we're fighting now. Father Faber comes to our help again. He says, I beg of God in his infinite compassion to keep alive in me to the last hour of my life the intense hatred of heresy with which he has inspired me and which I recognize as his gift. There's a gift we need for Christmas. Lord, 
grant me hatred of heresy. I beg of him, Father Faber says, to make it grow in me to an abhorrence far greater than it is yet. Heaven is the true land of love, but the hatred of heresy will not diminish there. For the hatred of heresy is the adoring love of God's ever-blessed truth. Do they hate in heaven? You bet they do. They hate error, sin, lies, and heresy. Father Faber, thank you. Soul of Christ, be my sanctification. O Lord, inform my intellect with thine intellect to know you perfectly and to banish the rest. O Lord, purify my memory with your memory. Fill it with your thoughts, with your one word. O Lord, help me to love what you love and to hate what you hate. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, amen.